down by old Joe's bar on a corner of the square. They were serving drinks as usual, and the usual crowd was there. On my left stood Big Joe McKennedy, and his eyes were bloodshot red, and he turned his face to the people. These were the very words he said. I was down to St. James Infirmary. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's GCLS virtual event. I'm Rachel. I'm the Adult Outreach and Event Coordinator for the Greenville County Library System. I'm so glad that you've joined us for this fantastic celebration of Josh White. This local legend not only was an accomplished musician, also a civil rights activist. So we're going to hear about all these different facets of his life and legacy this evening. We're going to have multiple parts tonight. First, we're going to have a quick screening of the video put together by librarians in our South Carolina room, honoring Josh White, talking about his life and legacy. Followed by that, we'll actually have a performance by Josh White Jr. performing some songs from the 1940s that Josh White would have performed on the road. So that's definitely something to look forward to. Then we'll hear from Joseph Thompson, the sculptor of the fantastic sculpture that's been installed in downtown Greenville, South Carolina. There will be an official unveiling in the fall, but anyone in South Carolina can come and check out that gorgeous sculpture in downtown Greenville. We'll have an interactive Q&A. So during any of these portions, if you have questions, please be sure to pop those into the chat that's in the bottom uh, right of your screen, just click on chat and then you can type in there. I'll be monitoring those questions so I can provide them to the people who are here who can answer them. We should have some special guests this evening, which I'll talk about when we get closer to the interactive Q&A. Um, but of course, feel free to pop those in there at any time. Also, if you have library related questions, I'll be happy to answer those for you as well. We also are going to get to hear from Josh White's grandson this evening. So we'll have a special Q&A session with him as well. And then at the end, we'll get to close out on a few more songs performed by Josh White Jr. So this is an action packed evening. Uh, and so I don't want to take away from any of our time tonight. So first, let's begin with a video giving you some background about the life of Josh White. While South Carolina can claim many celebrated musicians throughout history, a talented singer and guitarist born in Greenville, South Carolina, is often overlooked today. Throughout his charismatic career as a bluesman, cabaret star, and folk singer, Josh White at one time rivaled contemporaries such as Harry Belafonte and Bob Dylan for worldwide popularity. His charm and musical ability took him from humble beginnings, performing his brand of Piedmont blues in the early 20th century Southeast, to acclaim in New York City clubs in the 1940s and world over tours ushering in the folk music revival of the mid 20th century. At the start of the 20th century, Greenville, South Carolina, locally known as the Pearl of the Piedmont, was in the middle of an industrial revolution. Beginning in the 1870s, the great textile mills that grew up on the west side of the city soon became the dominant industry, eventually forming the economic basis of the entire upstate region well into the 1980s. Although the city's fortunes were improving after the social and political upheaval of the Civil War, the era of punitive and harsh racial regulation and suppression, known as the Jim Crow era, was in full swing. It was into this world that Josh White would be born. The city's social and infrastructure improvements were not equally shared by all the town residents. The trolley lines were created in 1899 and began running routes starting in 1902 but the cars were segregated, along with every other aspect of town life. By 1912, segregation in the city was written into the city code in an attempt to keep the races separate in all areas of life. By 1917, there were five white motion picture theaters on Main Street, but there were only two for the African-American population, and they were located on Washington Avenue near the train depot. Interestingly, Josh White had a minor movie role in a western called The Walking Hills, which according to this April 1950 Greenville News ad, 
was shown at local Liberty Theater. One of the reasons the textile mills made the move from their northeastern bases of operation was a desire to relocate closer to the source material of their industry, the cotton fields of the South. This 1911 image from the suburbs of Greenville shows the hands-on nature of cotton picking as it existed at the time. African Americans had traditionally done the labor necessary to produce cotton, from planting, to picking, to moving the bales to the mills, but they were mostly prohibited from working in the mills themselves. These jobs were reserved for the indigent white population, which had been recruited from the surrounding mountain communities. Under slavery, it was illegal to teach African Americans to read and write. However, by 1899, there were several elementary schools and one high school for black children in Greenville. Josh White is said to have made it to the sixth grade at Sterling High School, with a budding career in music already taking priority at a young age. Greenville's urban and rural African American families proved to be just as proud and hardworking as any other Americans even though they were prevented from full participation in the rewards of American life. Josh White's grandfather, Boschel Humphrey, was a servant of the Malden family of Greenville. In this turn-of-the-century photo of the houses on West Washington Street, the Sam Malden house is partially visible on the far left. Boschel Humphrey was the son of Tom Humphrey, an enslaved man born in Lawrence County. Although Boschel is first listed, as a Greenville resident in the 1901 Greenville City Directory in the colored block of Calhoun Street, he had been living in town since at least 1880 when he was listed as a servant in the William Malden household. Boschel had a daughter, Daisy Elizabeth Humphrey, who would go on to marry Dennis White, a local tailor and porter, as well as an occasional minister at the Allen Temple AME Church in Greenville. It is said that Daisy, also known to the family as Lizzie, was a meticulous housekeeper and enjoyed playing the auto harp. It was to these parents Josh White was born on February 11, 1914, and was himself drawn to music, singing in church at an early age. Sadly, Josh's childhood innocence would be short-lived when in 1921 his father was involved in an altercation with a white bill collector leading to Dennis White's violent arrest by the local police. Dennis was deemed mentally unfit, most likely due to a combination of daring to strike a white policeman in Jim Crow, South Carolina, as well as being epileptic, and placed in the custody of the state asylum in Columbia, South Carolina. Dennis would eventually die while incarcerated, apparently of pulmonary tuberculosis, in 1930. Without a father and a family in need of income, Josh, at just eight years old, convinced his mother to allow him to work as a lead boy to a host of regional blind blues minstrels. While Josh was paired with these bluesmen, beginning with neighbor Blind Man Arnold, and later musicians such as Blind Joe Taggart and Blind Lemon Jefferson, they would busk and perform around the Southeast and Midwest. While Josh said these men could treat him cruelly, he used the opportunity as a traveling showman to learn his musical craft and hone his skills as an entertainer. Most likely, Josh and these bluesmen would travel by way of railroad, considering that the Southern as well as P&N rail lines ran through Greenville in support of the textile industry, and had the benefit of connecting traveling musicians to many towns and small cities where they could perform. Josh would go on to learn guitar well enough to spend time in recording studios in Chicago, accompanying blind Joe Taggart and even making a few recordings of his own while still in his mid-teens. Eventually, Josh decided to travel back to Greenville to see his mother and return to life as a teenager in his hometown. During this time, and resting from a football injury, the opportunity to restart his career as a solo artist knocked when a record label representative came to Greenville to offer Josh a recording contract in New York City. One of the first songs he recorded at this time was a boastful reference to his roots called The Greenville Chic. Heard here. Oh, 
the Greenville kid, my name, folks, I'm trying to introduce myself to you. The Greenville kid is my name, trying to introduce myself to you. Says I'm all hot and bothered, but I don't know what to do. Said the kid not so hot and the Greenville kid not so cold. Greenville kid not so hot, Lord, the kid is not so cold. He's cause me to cause to worry about him deep down in their soul. While in New York, Josh's fame grew, not only from his recordings, but also his many performances at the infamous Cafe Society in Greenwich Village, which featured integrated blues, jazz, and folk acts. Also during this time, in 1940, with the help of famed folk archivist Alan Lomax, Josh performed for President Franklin D. Roosevelt and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt for events commemorating the 75th anniversary of the 13th Amendment, as well as an inaugural ball. In 1945, he was the first African American to perform a nationwide tour and was an unofficial advisor to the First Lady on racial issues. Unfortunately, Josh's associations with the Cafe Society would overshadow his relationship with the President and First Lady. In 1950, he was blacklisted for the perceived communist leanings of the Cafe Society's owners, patrons, and performers. Josh volunteered to explain himself to the House Un-American Activities Committee in September of that year in an attempt to assert his patriotism. Though Josh had only ever written protest songs in support of racial and economic equality, the damage was done to his career when the press painted Josh as betraying his progressive friends to the Red Scare. While his popularity due to political fallout waned stateside, Josh was able to carry on his musical career abroad and toured extensively in Europe as one of the most prominent black folk singers. Sadly, Josh would never again achieve the same level of acclaim in the U.S. and would pass away during open heart surgery in a Long Island hospital in September 1969. His gift of blues and folk music remains a major influence on musicians and music fans around the world, with Greenville, South Carolina memorializing a hometown music legend with an official Josh White monument to be dedicated in 2021. It was down by old Joe's bar On a corner of the square They were serving drinks as usual and the usual crowd was there On my left stood Big Joe McKennedy And his eyes were bloodshot red And he turned his face to the people These were the very words he said I was down to St. James Infirmary I saw my baby there She was stretched out on a long white table So sweet, cool, and so fair Let her go, let her go, God bless her Wherever she may be She may search this whole wide world over Never find a sweeter man as me when I die, please bury me in my high top Stetson hat. Put a $20 gold piece on my watch chain. The gang all know I die standing pat. Let her go, let her go, God bless her. Wherever she may be, she may search this whole wide world over. Now that you've seen the video and have more of an understanding of Josh White and his legacy, we're actually going to have the opportunity to watch his son, Josh White Jr., 
perform three songs. This is courtesy of the co-producer of the Greenwich Village Folk Festival, Ray Mysick, also a friend of the Josh White family. So these three songs are all about the social consciousness of the time. Josh White popularized these in the 1940s. This is where you see his music and his activism combine. Please enjoy and do make note of the footnotes on the screen so you can get a little bit more information. That's courtesy of Doug Yeager of um, Doug Yeager Productions. So enjoy. Yip Harburg, who wrote Somewhere Over the Rainbow, wrote this for my dad, which goes like this. to that St. James Infirmary And I saw some plasma there I upped and asked the doctor man Now was the donor dark or fair? The doctor laughed Great big laugh And he puffed it right in my face He said a molecule is a molecule, son and the damn thing has no race And that was news Yes, that was news That was very, very, very special news Because ever since that day We've had those free and equal blues You mean you heard that doctor declare That the plasma in that test tube could be a White man, black man, yellow man, red man that's just what that doctor said. Then he put down his doctor book and gave me a very scientific look. And he spoke out plain and clear and rational. He said, metabolism is international. And that was news. Yes, that was news. That was very, very, very special news. Because ever since that day we've had those free and equal blues. So I stayed at that St. James Infirmary. <laughs> I couldn't leave that place, it was too interesting. So I said to the doc, give me some more of that scientific talk talk, and he did. He said, melt yourself down into a crucible and pour yourself out into a test tube, and what have you got? 3,500 cubic feet of gas. That's the same for the upper and lower class. Well, well I had to lift that fast. Carbon, 22 pounds, 10 ounces. Iron, 57 grains. Not enough to keep a man in shape. 50 ounces of phosphorus, whether you're poor or prosperous. Hey, uh, buddy, can you spare a match? Uh, sugar, 60 ordinary lumps. Free and equal rations for all nations. Then you take 22 teaspoons of sodium chloride, that's salt, you add 30 quarts of H2O, that's water, you mix two ounces of lime, a pinch per quart of potash, a drop of magnesia, and a bit of sulfur, and a soup of hydrochloric acid, and you stir it all up, and what are you? A walking drugstore, an international metabolistic cartel. And that was news, yes that was news, so listen, you African and Indian, Mexican, Mongolian, Tyrolean, and Tartar. The doctor's right behind the Atlantic Charter. The doc's behind the new brotherhood of man. As prescribed at Gettysburg, Iwo Jima, at Bull Run, and at Guadalcanal. Every man, everywhere, is the same When he's got his skin off And that was news, yes that was news That's the free and equal blues Song. The next song is called I'm Marching Down Freedom Road, and that song was written by my dad and Langston Hughes. If you don't know the name Lang Langston Hughes, look him up. And uh, it goes like this. Oh, excuse me. That's why I'm marching. Yes, I'm marching. 
marching down Freedom Road. Ain't nobody gonna stop me, ain't nobody gonna keep me from marching down Freedom Road. It ought to be plain as the nose on your face. There's room in this land for every race. Some folk think that freedom just ain't right. Those are the very people I want to fight. That's why I'm marching, yes, I'm marching. Marching down Freedom Road. Ain't nobody gonna stop me. Ain't nobody gonna keep me from marching down Freedom Road. United we stand, divided we fall. Let's make this land safe for one and all. I've got a message, you know it's right. Black and white together, unite and fight. That's why I'm marching, yes, I'm marching. Marching down Freedom Road. Ain't nobody gonna stop me. Ain't nobody gonna keep me from marching down Freedom Road. So hand me my gun, let the bugle blow loud. I'm on my way with my head proud. One objective I've got in view is to keep a hold of freedom for me and you. That's why I'm marching, yes, I'm marching. Marching down Freedom Road. Ain't nobody gonna stop me. Ain't nobody gonna keep me from marching down Freedom down road. Abe Maripol wrote this next song that uh, my dad used to do called Strange Fruit. And whenever my dad did it, I could see in his eyes the strange fruit, because when my father was seven years old, he witnessed a man being hanged. And uh, so whenever he did this song, I saw that seven-year-old boy looking at that man that was hanged. Strange fruit. Sometimes it's Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the roots, black bodies swaying in the southern Pastoral scenes of the gallant south with the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth. Scent of magnolia, sweet and fresh, and the sudden smell of burning flesh here is a fruit for the crows to pluck for the rains to gather and for the winds to suck for the sun to rot for the tree to drop Ooh. Here is a strange and bitter crowd
are strange and bitter cry. Ramon, man. Thank you so much to Josh White Jr., of course, to Ray Misek and the uh, Greenwich Village Folk Festival as well for letting us use that footage. Um, we're so grateful to you. So now we have the wonderful opportunity to hear from the sculptor of the gorgeous sculpture that's in downtown Greenville. Joe Thompson's going to present to us to talk us through his journey with creating this masterpiece. Joe Thompson. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Okay, great. Um, well, first, I would like to uh, uh, just say thank you to Josh White Jr. and and um, for those incredible songs and and um, in my thinking about this pr presentation, you know, it spans um, four years and uh, of active work working on the on the project. Uh, pardon me. And I I really need to acknowledge um, the Josh the committee to commemorate Josh White, uh, Mary Duckett, Norman Belk, Dale Perry, and David and Lynn Vickery, um, who, who envisioned this project probably six years ago. They started talking to me about it. So those it, it, it was a, a, a community-based project uh, that was then supported by the, the city of Greenville. And I'm, I'm grateful to everyone for the ability to, uh, to do this project. So, um, okay, let's see if I can get the thing just to go. All right, I'm having a little trouble. Um, okay, fantastic, I was hitting the wrong button. Um, so this is the, the very beginning. This is the uh, fifth scale model that, that I developed um, to talk about three different stages of, of the life of Josh White. Uh, on the left is Josh White in early years in Greenville. And um, I envisioned that as Josh White uh, as a, a guide boy for um, blind man Arnold. And, um, and there was in, in my research, uh, particularly um, Elijah Wald's book, uh, a, a lot of commentary about how Josh White would steal the show when he was uh, uh, sort of collecting the coins for, for the musicians. And so I wanted to capture something about his early charisma there. The, uh, the middle panel, uh, really talks about uh, Josh White at, at the height of his international fame when, when he had in 1962 uh, a variety show in Stockholm, Sweden. And, and you know, the imagery, the video from that, that uh, show really captured me. And, um, and so that became the middle panel. And on the right panel, I wanted to capture something about his, his activism and his, his um, his desire to to create a you know a free and equal society, uh, so so that's the organization of of the sculpture and this ribbon that goes through it along the bottom was really meant to to sort of connect the Reedy River. Uh, so, all right, so I'm I'm getting a little momentum here, which is great. Um, I'm going to try not to bore everybody with my 28 slides, so I'll probably start moving a little quicker, but. This is the full scale drawing. And in this, I was working out both what the imagery would be like and what the text, text would, would say. And um, I, had a lot of, uh, I had a lot of ideas, but at the end of the day, it was really coming down to, to what, what could I create as a, a, a cohesive composition that would really tell this story. So I'll say at, the, at, at this stage that you know, I noticed that, that Josh White's life was really bracketed by, by blindness, right? The blindness of the Jim Crow era and, and the blindness of our society not wanting to change during the civil rights movement. And so I bracketed that, uh, that idea 
so blindness sort of bracketed the life of Josh White. But at the end of the day, I was trying to show that that he was such a visionary and, and he had the the vision to to transcend those boundaries. And so if you look carefully at this screen, you see an eye sort of coming through the center of the background of the, the piece uh, with the, um, the, the pupil of the eye uh, right there in the middle. So that was a, an overarching idea for the composition. So, so some of this gets a little bit technical, but people have, have been asking me how I did it. So I transferred the, the drawing by placing the drawing on top of the a clay um, frame that I made for, for the project and then transferring through poking holes in the, in the paper and it transferred the image in, in that way. And this on, on the third panel is, uh, uh, shows the buildup of the, of the imagery and, and my ability to then begin to really develop the imagery from the source material. Um, here is Josh White singing of, of the needs for, for equality while, um, you know, the liberty, blind justice, blind justice rather, is, is sitting down on the job, motioning towards this um, line of slaves. And here is the um, three panels as they're being developed with the, the, the text carved into the plaster. The, the text on the front of the piece was hand carved and, um, and, and was a, a, a really big endeavor. And I had great help from a, a, a young man named Griffin Cordell, who was, uh, had recently graduated from the governor's school, who turned out to be better at carving those letters than me. So, um, so he had a summer job that summer. Uh, this is a, a detail. Um, so I started with the, the idea for the sculpture, but then developed ideas as, as I as I developed the sculpture, developed it visually. So I decided to put this cameraman as, as a way of sort of stretching the space of the, of the release sculpture. Uh, and this was the, the reveal of the, of the imagery before it went to the foundry in March of, of 2019. So the foundry was, was um, you know, a, a year long project process. This, this uh, foundry was um, a small operation and, and uh, Jack uh, Ward was the name of the, of the founder and he, he did really a, an incredible job at this as you'll see as we go through the, the casting process. So you have to create a, this is a negative mold that creates a, a wax positive of the original clay. So here is the, a lower section of that, that um, the middle panel, or actually, I guess that's the, the left panel. And, um, and he would then uh, make another um, mold, a refractory mold of the wax. Um, and that's how you create the, these panels. But what, what Jack found was that um, they became really unwieldy and uh, he had the molds actually break in his first two pores, they split, there was too much pressure. So he had to cut the molds, the, the waxes in half. Um, and Jack uh, was absolutely resilient and determined and, and really rescued the project um, by, by his craftsmanship and his ingenuity. So here is the the bronze cast after it's broken out of the shell mold and cleaned up. And then uh, the, the, he, he welded the sculptures back together. So this is the middle panel. It was cast in eight pieces. And uh, for anyone who's seen the sculpture, you can't find those seams. So it's, he, he was remarkably talented in that aspect. While the casting was happening, I was designing and, and fabricating the, the, the frame. So the frame, it was decided which should be made in bronze to avoid the, the issues of rust and oxidation. And as I researched it, I, I really felt that the, the solid ramp stock would be the best 
uh, material. And so here I'm uh, laying out welding, fabricating, bending uh, that material to create the frame. And this is the front frame. Uh, and this is the front frame finishing. So there were two frames that were then put together uh, to, to, as a structure to house the, the panels. So in January of 2020, uh, the, uh, the sculpture was finished and this is with a rough patina on it. Um, and here I think you can see the, the skill involved with the casting. Yeah, for which I'm so grateful for. After I got the panels, the art panels and the text panels back, I needed to figure out a way to physically mount them and attach them to the frame. And it also, I had to think about how to transport it and how to install it and how in the future it would come apart because it was so big and heavy that it would have been, un, I would have been unable to, to transport it and to work on it uh, as a single piece. So this gives you a sense of the mechanical aspects of, of, of the sculpture. Um, the, the text panels were cast at a different foundry, um, East Point Foundry in uh, South Atlanta. And uh, this is my friend Jack uh, agreed to help me put those panels together because the, the, uh, the foundry was unable to, to do the welding. So Jack and I worked together to get those panels together, which involved a lot of um, nine pound hammers and uh, anvils and um, some effort to, to get that to work. So uh, the panels remained unfinished without a paint or a, a patina finish because I had to then further weld uh, the, the pieces when they got back to Greenville. So uh, here's the, the sculpture in the background and I'm now beginning to think about moving the project to a warehouse in Malden, South Carolina, where I, I could have a flat floor and I could use equipment to, to move uh, the project. So each of the frames weighs over 500 pounds and, and I needed to be able to move those myself with, with equipment. And um, here we are uh, on the way to, um, to the warehouse. So that was going on in Malden. Then, you know, last summer I had to think about how do I deal with the edges? And, and this was yet another structure that I, I built and that was required. Uh, and, and I had to figure out how to create an enclosure and how to install that enclosure um, and how to do it on site and how, how it would mechanically come apart. So this is an interior of my studio with that work going on. And, uh, and of course, the, uh, the panels, when they're removed, they have to be moved carefully because at this time there, they have quite a lot of value and a lot of value for me to finish the project. So here is, uh, finally, I'm, I'm making final adjustments to the, to the placements of, of the panels on the structure. And, um, and now beginning to figure out how to, to brace the structure. Uh, the wooden box underneath the structure is a, a replica of the, uh, or the dimensions of the granite base so that I could see it and, and, and understand how it would all go together. And here it is now as a freestanding structure with the, uh, I'm about to remove the wooden interior, but this is now completely welded together. And, um, and before I try to uh, uh, install the, the frame onto the granite with a crane downtown, I actually transported the frame to the granite company and um, Alexander Granite and Easley and, and, and I pre-fit every single piece so that when I was um, installing with the crane on installation day, um, I would, be assured that, that I had done my homework and that everything would fit. Finally, I had to account for the, the cap structure that would support the lights. Um, so that, that was fabricated and then installed. Uh, and there is the cap structure on top of the assembled sculpture um, at uh, Productions Unlimited where I um, 
where I, where I contracted to do the the lighting, uh, and 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 um, and here is the uh, the Josh White project installed um, at Fall, on Falls Park uh, Drive. It, it was finished actually on March 25th, uh, but but granted to presented to the city on March 26th. And um, and here is the the final sculpture and and uh, and I hope everyone will get a chance to see it uh, in person, to to sit with it, to to reflect on it, um, and and I want to say that um, particularly to the Josh White family and and Josh White Jr. who I had the the honor of meeting several years ago that I, I it's just a real. Um, um, privilege and, and, and honor for me in my career to have been associated with, with, uh, with Josh White. All right, thank you so much. That was incredible. What an incredible amount of work um, and so many things that had to all work together in order for it to, <laughs> to come together uh, in that final beautiful piece. Um, and I love, we were talking before the program started about seeing it in the daytime and in the nighttime are two separate experiences. Right. Thank you. Yes, in, indeed. Yeah, I think that really the late afternoon is the best time for natural light, and um, it's it's lit all night long, so <laughs> you can see it at any time at night. So if you can't sleep, then go on down, <laughs> down and <laughs> it's open twenty four seven. Yeah. Well, in a moment, we're going to open up the floor to some interactive. Q&A. Um, you'll be able to ask questions of Joe about the sculpture um, and, and anything you're interested in about that. You can ask um, the creator of the video that the library put together um, about that process as well. I do believe that we have some um, members of the White family with us this evening too. So if anyone would like to share their um, experience, uh, we'll, be, we'll be welcoming that as well. While you're thinking of your questions, we do have a, another little thing we can show you. Uh, Josh White III, known as Buddha, uh, could not be here tonight for the live event, but he did sit down with me earlier today to answer some questions about his uh, grandfather's legacy. Um, so I'm going to share that with you right now. Joining us, we're here tonight with Josh White III, uh, also known as Buddha in the performance world. And we're going to ask him some questions about his grandfather and his grandfather's legacy. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I, it's, honestly, I, I wasn't expecting to be invited to this. So thank you very much for the invitation. You're quite welcome. Yes, we definitely want to honor all of Josh White's family as we start the celebration. So let me ask you some questions. First of all, how do you carry on your grandfather's legacy? Oh, well, um, you know, it's really funny because um, I do try to make our name live up to, or to me live up to our name. Um, I am an actor. Um, at one point when I was um, in college, I thought, well, you know what? My grandfather and my dad, they were both musicians, so I'm gonna be a mime. And I studied mime with Marcel Marceau for two years and have been doing mime for the last 35. Oh, wow. Um, but despite the fact that the, the differences from music to silence doesn't negate the fact that I'm still fulfilling our family's legacy. Yeah. So um, that, that's, I, I keep our skin in the game, so to speak. I love that. <laughs> well, what most inspires you about your grandfather and his story? I had the pleasure of knowing my grandfather for six years. Now granted, maybe three of those years, I was totally incomprehensive, but <laughs> I, I knew him, I, he died when I was six and I have, I have beautiful memories of him. Yet, as I've grown older, I've learned about him and the struggles that he went through and the, the, the things that he had to overcome, 
the the things that he did that are just amazing. Mm -hmm. And so the man himself inspires me because he pretty much went through the entire gamut and still came out with his dignity intact, with his self-respect intact, and always trying to make a point or, 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 or leave a message to have something there that says, whoa, wait a minute, let me think about that. Wow, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think he made an impact, not only in society, but in me personally. Oh, I Just by the way that he was. That's wonderful. And I'm so glad that you were able to have that relationship with your grandfather as a young, young boy. I'm grateful for that too. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about the sculpture installation this evening, what does the sculpture installation mean to you? And, and how well do you think Green, Greenville has done in remembering your grandfather? I think that the sculpture is amazing. I actually, um, when it was actually deposited on River, River Street, I had a friend who was in town and she sent me pictures. So I was able to look at it up close and personal. And then I was um, in talking with Mary Duckett and, um, and the articles that Joe Thompson had, had done was able to actually see up close and personal um, everything that he tried to produce on each of the tri trick arts or however you say that word. Mm -hmm. And I think it is a phenomenal monument. It is phenomenal. I think that, that his artistry is wonderful. I think Joe Thompson did a wonderful job um, in trying to follow my grandfather's life. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm very pleased. I think that the, I, I understand that Greenville has several um, hometown heroes. That's true. And I am just, I am grateful and um, impressed that they would like to include my family into their hometown hero section. Absolutely. That's it's what we should be doing. So I'm really glad that he's getting the recognition um, now, especially with the sculpture. Uh, when you're here for the unveiling, you'll also have to check out, there's an art mural next to Horizon Records that also features your grandfather. Oh, so you'll okay. have to see oh, that too. <laughs> yeah. Definitely taken in the town. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so how do you think your grandfather's story relates to contemporary issues of equality and freedom? No, that is a very interesting question considering the times that we were in right now. Mm -hmm. um, in all honesty, and, and just coming right off the cuff, I think that people have forgotten the struggle that we've gone through as a society, not, not just Black people or, you know, um, whatever lives matter at this particular time and day. And day. I think that, that, that people have forgotten what we have gone through for the last 150 years. I mean, this struggle is no different than it was in the 60s or in the 1890s. You know, there have always been people who have been oppressed because of what they represent to society. Right. And that was one of the things that my grandfather was very adamant about trying to change. And so if people could just as they say, you know, if you don't remember your history, it's destined to repeat itself. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a it's it's a tough it's a tough question to answer right now. There's, there's no there's no definitive answer because because as times change, we get allegedly smarter and wiser. Yet at the same time, I think that that we regress in our intellect. You know, and, and we want, we choose to forget what happened in the past and not let it be relatable to what's going on now. Right. And it's, it's, it's really kind of sad because yeah. if we remembered what happened 50 years ago or 150 years ago, we could stop what's going on now because we'd be tired of it. Mm -hmm. It'd be done. Mm -hmm. We'd recognize that we are all one people. 
that as long as we have respect for each other, then there would really be no disrespect in, in society. Right. No, that's an excellent point. <laughs> You're right. And I think it was so, you know, it was such a, a bold and daring move for your grandfather to make to be so vocal, you know, in, in a time, especially where he was going to be, you know, persecuted for it. And yeah, I, I don't believe that he even considered the, the persecution aspect of it. Hmm. I think that he just believed that based on his upbringing, you know, starting out at eight years old, and having to do and live through the things that he did, I don't think it was it was a choice. I just think it was a natural thing for him to want to stand up for everybody. Right. Incredible. <laughs> just for that to be a part of his nature. Amazing. <laughs> well, and then, so to bring together the civil rights activism and his musical career, I'd like to ask one last question. Which of your grandfather's songs is your favorite? Oh, see, that's just it. I, I, I can't say that there's any one song. Um, I could name five songs and, and each one has a different reason to be a favorite. So it, it's, you know, instead of there just being one, there's a line of ones going around. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But, um, but among those, St. James Infirmary, mm. um, Free and Equal Blues. I'm not sure if you you are you know that song. I do. Yes, that is one of my favorites because it just it just says something. Mm -hmm. You know, it it talks about everything we were just talking about. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho. I mean, that was allegedly the whole reason that he started leading blind street musicians in the first place. So yeah, there's, those are three. How about that? <laughs> I think that's good. It's, it's a terrible question to ask anyone just like we get upset sometimes when people ask librarians and, you know, avid readers, what's your favorite book? How could I possibly pick one? <laughs> <laughs> Same problem. Well, we thank you so much for being willing to talk to us uh, tonight about your grandfather and your father. And we are just so grateful for your family and so glad that this unveiling of this sculpture is happening so you all can be a part of it too. Well, I, again, appreciate your inviting me to do this. And I look forward to October 9th when I can be a part of in, you know, because I have to work today. So, um, but so I can be a part of the actual unveiling ceremony. Well, Greenville will welcome you with open arms when you come. I look forward to it. And again, I can't thank you enough for allowing me this privilege to talk about my family. So, thank you to uh, Josh White III, Buddha. We appreciate you sharing your time with us uh, earlier today. So, now the floor is open for some QA. So if you've thought of anything, we also encourage you to please unmute yourself. You can turn on your video. That way you can talk to uh, everyone. We'll make it sort of a conversation. We've give, we're have we given a lot to th think about this evening. Uh, so many questions that we could ask. So please, uh, if anyone has a question, let's go ahead and open the floor. Uh, I am the youngest of the White family. I'm Judith Gord, used to call by the nickname Love Bug. And I just am looking at all of this wonderful detailed work that our sculpture has done. And it was a heart work. It was a hand work. It was beautiful. And I could not let this day go by without just letting him know how much is appreciated and how much of his heart we see in the work that he has presented tonight. I love it. And I, I cannot wait until I'm able to actually see it uh, face to face. I just love to see it. what a great remembrance that is. I love it so much. And I thank, uh, I thank Greenville. I thank him most of all for the, all the work that he put together. Those that worked with him, he had a uh, a, a talk he had people that were just working with him and I think that is so wonderful the work that was the networking that was done and how well it was done I just really thank you so much Judith I thank you so much for for those comments you cannot 
uh, I'm, I'm actually moved by them. I can't um, express how gratifying it is to hear that, that I connected with, with you and, and with Buddha and hopefully your entire family. Uh, it, it, it was absolutely a labor of love by the committee to commemorate Josh White. And, and I will tell you that uh, every single person who became involved in the project, the, the foundry uh, people, the, the, my helpers, uh, the people who did the lights, everybody got on board and went so much further than what was asked or what was required. And so I think the spirit of the project was was clear throughout, and uh, and I am I, I received your your thanks, and I'm grateful. So thank you. And thank you so much for being here tonight. We so appreciate you taking yes. the time to do that. That's wonderful. All right? Does anyone have any questions for for anyone? Um, who might be able to answer them. Remember, we have a representative who have worked on the video. Of course, Joe willing to answer questions about the sculpture. We've got people involved with the Josh White family here as well. So anyone uh, can, can hop in at any time and, and ask a question. And one to kick, kick one off, if it, anyone has any more words, a question that I asked um, his grandson earlier, uh, you know, what most inspires you of the, of the Josh White story? Is uh, Josh White Jr. there? He was not able to be with us live tonight, I'm afraid. Uh, that's too bad. It is. Doug Yeager and I used to manage Josh White. I think I know Judy from way back in uh, probably the, I guess the 70s or the 80s. Oh, I think, wow. we, I think we even did a record with, uh, with you and, and your sisters. <laughs> Say your name. That's David Wilkes talking. And that's Doug Yeager talking. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, my daughter just bought a house in the in the Greenville area in Greenwood Lakes. So I'll probably be, be visiting you guys uh, shortly. Good. We'll see you on October 9th. Good. All right. I'll be there probably. <laughs> Sorry to, to jump in, but. No, that's wonderful. Thank you for, for letting us know. We're so glad you could join us. I'll, I'll just add one other thing. I used to be the doorman and the manager of Bitter End while uh, Josh Sr. was there. And I had many conversations with him about his fingers and the pain that he went through when he performed. And then, of course, I met uh, Donnie you know, Jr. and Doug Yeager and I managed him together for many, many years. And then I knew Buddha when he was just a young kid, so like six years old. So I've got three generations of, of the Josh Whites. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know the family intimately. <laughs> well, pretty much, you know, yeah. It's a great family, lovely family. Well, thank you for that. We, we do have a question in the chat. Um, did he travel the Chitlin circuit is the question there. Um, I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, I could... I, I could say that he didn't, and um, that that was a specific. It was like the Black Vaudeville Circuit. He didn't he didn't tour with the Black Vaudeville Circuit. He uh, early in his career in the 1930s, when he was a gospel music star, he performed at churches and um, uh, and church concerts, etc. and and there were blues clubs that he played to and uh, before he became real popular, but he never did the Chitlin circuit. But there were people from the Chitlin circuit that he did record with. And because um, and, and, he performed, because he had so many different musical genres that he was known for. Uh, initially he was, uh, a Southern rural Negro blues gospel and folk singer. And, uh, but by the time he was 30 years old, he had refined his artistry and uh, wasn't singing only that type of music. He was singing uh, uh, English folk songs, Australian songs like Waltzing Matilda and uh, 
songs written by Cole Porter, like Miss Oldest Regrets. And so he, uh, I can't think of another artist other than maybe Bing Crosby, who had popular songs in so many different genres of music. And because uh, most, most recording stars, once they became popular, they only sang the same type of music. But Josh, um, it, it was almost like anything that he liked and moved him, he wanted to sing it. And, uh, and when he first went to Europe and toured there, and you read the articles, they were just uh, amazed that here was this Black American man singing their folk songs from 500 years ago and backing it with a, a blues guitar. I mean, it was just so unique to them and, and they just loved it. And, um, and just one other thing I wanted to say, but when I started, when um, his widow, Mrs. Josh White, Carol White asked me to represent the estate now, I don't know, 48 years ago, um, and I started researching his history, etc. Uh, I really can't think of another artist in the 20th century who uh, the first 16 years were almost like the movie Roots. He didn't wear shoes till he was 16 years old and slept in cotton fields and saw people uh, tarred and feathered and lynched. And yet, um, Magically, 15 years later, he, he was the first black man accepted in the white society, was friends of, of aristocracy, of high society, and arguably the closest black confidant to the president of the United States. So, uh, you know, it was almost like he lived in two centuries, but it was in a short period of time. He, he had a unique life and career. Oh, absolutely. Yes, to have touched all those different aspects. Absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing, um, Doug. We really appreciate that. You're in a unique position with your information. He manages the White Estate. Um, so Doug is a great source of information, wealth of knowledge. Thank you. <laughs> My father also was one that never called himself a singer. He called himself a storyteller. And so the stories that he would hear through the songs that he heard and he enjoyed the story, he wanted to share those stories. And that's how he looked upon himself. So therefore it was easy for him to learn so many other songs and have so many other genres because whatever touched him, whatever said something gave a message of some kind, whether sometimes it was funny and sometimes they were tragic, but he would share them. He would share them. I love that. I love that he called himself a storyteller. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and if you have any stories of, of growing up that you'd like to share, feel free to do that as well. <laughs> what I enjoyed mostly, was not only singing at home, whenever dad, I was always, we were always excited when dad was coming home. But we were going to be singing with dad and wherever he was, if he was going to be performing in the city, in the state, then we were going to be able to be with him. We loved bothering him from backstage. So he would be singing and we would try to heckle him from backstage. <laughs> <laughs> we loved doing it. It was so much fun to the point that he decided, okay, I'm going to pull you out. <laughs> he would pull us from backstage and have us come up and there we would have to learn on spot, on call, the song that he wanted us to sing. So you better be quick with your eyes, <laughs> listen to what he's saying, repeat it, know what you're supposed to do. And that was fun. It really wasn't hard. And so we would have to learn on the spot. And that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I heard you uh, asking Buddha, what were some of his favorite songs? Walking Matilda was one for me. The House I Live In was another one. I loved also Strange Fruit. Mm -hmm. I loved retaining to 
what is going on today in our world that was going on then when he began to sing the song. It's called uh, St. James Infirmary. And it, it actually says in one part of the on one part of the verse, it says, a molecule is a molecule, son, and the damn thing has no race. <laughs> and so that's how he felt. There is not saying that we're colorblind or that there is no race, but for us to treat one another like we are human beings. Treat one another with the respect of a human being, having the same rights. For certainly he saw those uh, while he was growing up, the Blacks that did not have the same life. And I believe that God preserved his life to not only see it, but to sing about it. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and, and, you know, I mentioned this earlier too. I think it, it's incredible that, that the songs can have so much meaning to us today. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sign of a true artist <laughs> and a visionary, really. Yes. Uh, we do have a question in the chat for the um, sculptor, uh, Joe. Um, with Josh White Day recognized, um, and we do have a Josh White Day in Greenville now, uh, it would be great to see a festival or tradition <laughs> around the sculpture. In making it, did you have any visions of what life it might take for bringing folks together? Um, you know, I, I, I uh... I, I didn't really. I, what what I wanted to do was get it finished in in a way that would honor Josh White and in, in a and with with um, with some integrity and, and with some honesty and um, and I think what artists do is they hope that then the the artwork takes on a life of its own and you know my my job was to get it here and uh, I you know I've had so many people comment. Uh, to me in, in the last month of, about um, the power that they see in, in the piece and, and the and so you know I hope that uh, as Judith is saying and as Doug is saying and really everyone is commenting I hope that this is a, a marker for for an understanding that that it doesn't matter what your race is, but it matters who you are and, and, and that you be respectful to, to other people. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what it will happen with this sculpture. We hope good things. <laughs> may, may I just add something that, that you said uh, earlier? You said uh, now that there's a Josh White day, um, uh, is that date today or will that be October 9th? As I understand it, the official day is actually in August. Um, August was, 20th. Yeah, okay. August 20th, 2016 is when it was the first day. Yeah. My, my thought was, uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a folk festival every year on that day in Greenville? That's an excellent idea. Jack Williams will do it. I'll be there. <laughs> good. Have, to have, you, have, Jack. good to see you, Doug. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. Uh, I do have a rhetorical question for Greenvillians. I was born in South Carolina in Lancaster, about 100 miles east of Greenville. And um, I grew up in the conservative surroundings, extremely conservative surroundings. And I know that I've always loved Greenville for its mix of extraordinarily conservative Bob Jones University over to the extremely liberal, such as Cafe and then some. I hope it's still operating. It is. Uh, great news. And just this wonderful mix of liberality and conservatism, which creates this beautiful friction. But the, the thing that I was most interested in when I heard that there was going to be a Josh White Day on August 20th, I believe it was, um, I was thrilled uh, to hear this. I just want to know what happened culturally in Greenville, what upheaval, what forces came to bear to cause this community to decide to recognize this great man as a favorite son? That's a rhetorical question. Maybe there's no good answer, but I'll take anything anybody has to say. But I'm, I'm extremely proud of my home state in Greenville, uh, much more so than I used to be <laughs> because of this very event. And uh, I'd just like to hear what anybody has to say about that. 
Norman Belk, you could answer that as. Well, I don't know if you can see me. I think I've got everything like it should be to see me. Can anyone see me? Yes. Yes. Good. I'm glad. I'm, I'm a native Greenvillian. And uh, the only thing I can say is it appeared to me at the times that you're talking about when the cafe and then some came along and other things were happening, that one thing seemed to beget the other. Uh, the strong conservatism, which was very public, seemed to create a if not an underground, at least a thinking about what life could be in another way. And Cafe and Then Some is a good example. And the Josh White Project is a good example. And just general intellectual thinking, I think is a good example of many, many people who live here. I don't know. Thank if that's you, that was, that was well said. That's, that was well said, but there is something going on there that, um, that um, allows for such a thing as the celebration in a, an extremely conservative town for the celebration of this man, a black musician, a great humanitarian yeah. to be celebrated. And uh, I'm just thrilled about this whole thing. I'm thrilled about the sculpture. I was thrilled about Josh White Day. And I'm thrilled to be here with you all. <laughs> I, I could just uh, follow that thought. and. It almost seemed to me that uh, over the last decade or so, uh, it appeared that Greenville went through a catharsis and a healing. And uh, instead of shying away from their dark past history that many Southern cities did, they decided to recognize it and to acknowledge it and to uh, move beyond it, move forward, and and um, have projects where blacks and whites can work together and celebrate a famous black green Greenvillian, if that's a word, from yeah. from from the past century, and and I think that's beautiful. I can uh, also echo that a little bit. Sorry, I'm not on camera. Uh, it's David Sims up here. Um, I uh, am from the area as well. And I've noticed that uh, in doing some research on Josh White for one of my own projects that um, uh, that he wasn't really mentioned much in the newspaper till around the 90s. There was a kind of a, a growing uh, uh you know, presence uh, of of this kind of recognition in newspapers in the in the early and mid '90s, and people like Gene Berger and other folks who started to do that. But also, I think to the larger point about Greenville, it's become more of an international town. Uh, Twenty plus years ago, BMW came in, and um, ever since then, you you hear people speaking different languages on the streets. It's much more international. Uh, and it, it's hard to find a native actually. Um, and, and, you know, depending, Joe can maybe attest to this, um, when, when you are, you know, in, in downtown, it's, um, it's, it's just a, a, a different, uh, mix of people now than it used to be. Um, and I think growing up here in the eighties, I saw a very different situation, uh, much more locked down, much more conservative in, in that way. And, uh, and so I think a lot of it, started to happen with that growing international uh, uh, influence um, that kind of helped things along in the late 90s and uh, turn of the century. And if you recognize that voice, uh, David Sims is also doing a podcast. The link is in the chat uh, with his first episode on Josh White. So make sure to check that yeah, out. Thank you. Thank you for putting that in there. I appreciate it. Sure. So Greenville Music History Project. Yeah, yeah, it's for the whole, it's for uh, uh, a lot of different episodes, but we thought the first one uh, should be on Josh White just because it's the the biggest and and uh, and required the most production <laughs> as far as podcasts go. And uh, it's just a, a fantastic subject to dig into um, over the last, you know, year or so. And, uh, you know, like anybody else who does this kind of work, you feel like you've gotten to know him. And, you uh, Joe is on the podcast. Um, appreciate that, and uh, he—I'm sure had the same experience. You feel like you knew the man after you you dig into his life and, and see enough of his uh, uh, film work and, and 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 hearing all of his music. It's, it's remarkable. Yes, and indeed, I really did have a sense of uh, of you know I, I felt like I was surrounded by Josh White for for several years, and, <laughs> and it was a it was a good good thing. Absolutely. 
I used to play, perform in Greenville during the 1980s and uh, into the early 90s. And having been a long time Josh White music fan, yeah. I, um, I was astounded to come here and realize that the mere mention of his name didn't bring about a flash of recognition from anybody. I was That's playing right. music for the people. No one knew who he was. Um, I, I'm seeing how there aren't as many people I would, I would hoping to see on the screen today of people who would be aware. I'm just hoping that this sculptor makes a difference in the town to where people will just say, okay, who is this guy? You know, why do we have this sculptor here? And then they go to Google, they go to YouTube and they find out that there's a handsome man with his foot up on the chair and no guitar strap and his white shirt open at the collar and mesmerizing <laughs> all these white audiences with his gorgeous singing and his style, which was not old fashioned blues. It was, it was, um, it was his own thing. He was not like the old, oh baby, oh baby. Uh, it was not that. It was, it was that wonderful amalgam of, of music that he adopted into his own style. And um, I, just, I just hope that it just opens up that area to the appreciation. I mean, I hope that sculpture is a catalyst for an appreciation for Josh White in his hometown because he deserves every bit of it. And uh, I'm just pleased as I can be. May I say something, please? Um, David Vickery, I was on the committee, but we have to give credit for finding who we were going to do a sculpture to Dale Perry. Uh, he, he's a member of the committee. He's not on this tonight, uh, but Dale Perry, can you hear me? Yes. Dale yes. Perry is the one who came up with the idea and presented it to the committee, which consisted of Norman, uh, Mary Duckett. Mary Duckett and me and my wife and that's all and uh, so we give credit to Dale for recognizing uh, uh, Josh White and his greatness first and then introducing the rest of us to it. Well, thank you to the committee and for thinking of this wanting to do it and moving it forward and Joe to have spent four years of your creative life working on this. I, I don't know, most authors write books in less time than it took you to make this. And and my thinking of writing a book is, is almost impossible. So I, I am just so amazed and thankful and, and uh, appreciative of what you've done. Thank you so much, Doug. I was totally in over my head, so I just kept going. <laughs> 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 you couldn't go back. <laughs> <laughs> what an amazing group of people that all had to come together at just the right time to make this happen. Um, so thank you to all of you. Thank you, um, David, for, for chiming in about that as well. I'm glad to see members of the committee here tonight. Um, too. We, we're so appreciative of your work. And, and you know, that's, that's why we're here talking about a statue for, for all, the, all the work that you've done. And may I also say, David, I listened to the broadcast of the podcast. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much for listening and for all your help, Doug. My pleasure. <laughs> wonderful. All right. Does anyone have any other questions this evening? Oh. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah, I would like for Joe to tell everyone <clears throat> what his original inspiration for the design was. Well, the... the um... You know, the, the, the idea was trying to show uh, how an incredible human being transcended the, the bonds and the limits that society put on him. And so I used this idea of vision and blindness. And, uh, and, and actually it was intuitive. The, the whole thing wasn't really <coughs> clear to me until one of my brothers, who's a, a writer came and looked at the, the imagery and he said, this is what I think this is about. Is this what you intended? And then I began to capitalize on that idea. Good, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, great question. All right. Any other questions about anything? Um, 
Mike is going to put, he's with uh, the Greenville Library. He worked on the video uh, that the library put out. Um, he's going to put in the chat some uh, information about accessing some more materials about Josh White through the library, if you're interested in pursuing some more. I, I see two of Josh White's grandsons. Besides Buddha, we, we have Guy and Vincent here. Um, if if they would want to just say a few words. Please do. Joan, how is everyone? Um, sorry for joining you so late, but um, uh, I can't speak for my whole family per se, but I do know that we are honored and quite happy and just blessed to have had this um, take place, that there is still an interest um, in my grandfather, in his family. And I have to especially thank Mr. Doug Yeager uh, he has been a tremendous, tremendous. He is a family member. His last name is Jaeger, but it just might as well be White <laughs> because he has been the conduit of information. He has been the champion of all uh, of the endeavors that have gone on, all the interests, all the different things that have gone on in the interests of the Josh White estate, in the interests of um, Josh White Jr., our whole family. And um, we love Doug. I have loved this man for a very, very long time. In two weeks, I'll be 51 years old, and I've known that man my entire life. <laughs> I just want to thank him publicly because even though I know there is obviously still na national and global interest in my grandfather, I don't think a lot of these things would have come about if it were not for the efforts and hard work of Mr. Doug Yeager. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I think that you're tremendous, and I am just so glad that this is happening again and you're a part of it. Love you, guy. I completely agree. <laughs> Doug is just a brother. That's who he is. And even when we didn't know what to do, because there is a certain part of the family that there's a group that does this and there's a group that you have to have every component in the family. And Doug is that component that would help to give forth the information, to remind and to have log of it. We are in it, yes, but to be able to log and to remember each incident and be able to regurgitate it so that even we are reminded, of, that's right, that did happen. And I really, really appreciate Doug doing what he has always done. He just does it. It's just automatic. He, that's his daddy. It's his second daddy. So... Uh, my brother just does what he does. And I thank you so much, Doug. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Love you, Judy. Thank you both for sharing that. Uh, I've, I've only worked with Doug for about a week or so, and I can also agree. <laughs> He's a dream to work with. <laughs> thank you for all of your help. Was there another? Um, yes. <laughs> was there another grandchild who wanted to say something? I just want to take a quick second and... Uh... <clears throat> Say thank you to every person uh, who's responsible for, for helping to make this amazing monument. Uh, for years, it has been um, it has been the responsibility of uh, our aunts and, and my, my uncle to kind of make sure that we have information. And, and I likewise share with my children. And for years, every year uh, for Black History Month, I'd be my grandfather because I knew, nobody knew about it. Um, but Joe, thank you for allowing your hands to help illustrate something amazing, a story that can live on that does not specifically require our mouths to speak. Um, and being an artist, I would, I would, I absolutely know that Josh would probably absolutely love to, to know that, that his life lives on in a way that, that, that tells a story. He was a storyteller with all his music. He was, he shared tremendously and to know that his story gets told even when the guitar is silent. You know, literally your piece of artwork allows his story to live on without anyone having to know how to play guitar like him, because I don't know how. But I am excited to know that I can bring my children to come and touch and to see this amazing monument, especially at the dedication. We intend to be there in October. Thank you so much, comedian, for every one of you who have done such an amazing job to help make a voice not be lost in the wind of the United States. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I hope it speaks loudly and for a very long time. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, and thank you again, um, Joe, again, for, for your, your masterful work. We was able to view some of it, um, you know, uh, visually so far. And um, we'll be so excited to try to be there in October to, um, to touch it and actually see it. Yes. And, and see it unveiled. But, um, but of course, we want to thank all of our family. But again, just like we thank Doug, who may not be blood, but he's definitely our family. I have to shout out Mr. Ray Misek also. Um, who has been another staple in our family and in our lives, and I think would also be considered part of the family who is still right here supporting as usual, who has been a member of my family before I was a member of my family. <laughs> he was actually the paper boy to the house that Josh White built in, uh, the, excuse me, he owned in Rosedale, Queens, New York, and became such a uh, fixture in our family that even I know um, how long Ray has been attached to us. So I just wanted to shout him out because I know he's on here also and thank him for his support because he always forwards information and keeps us abreast of things um, as much as he can. And, and just like Doug has always been a support. And so just want to thank him also. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, we're, we're grateful to him. And, and as I mentioned before, he's the reason we had some footage of Josh White Jr. tonight. So thank you so much uh, for that. I feel so honored that so many of you have come out tonight uh, who are part of the family. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to do this for our, our library here in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. And we look forward to seeing you when you come uh, in October. So we hope you'll stop by the library. <laughs> um, we'd love to talk to you more and, and get more of your stories too. So so be sure to look us, uh, look us up when, when you're in town. Yeah, just make sure you include at least one picture with his great wife because um, Carol White was our rock also. So I hope somewhere in there, they are definitely seeing her face because um, it wouldn't be complete without her. Great. Just thinking on what mom, what Carol would be doing. She, I know she is beaming. It just so happened that she was the catalyst to make sure that there was a stamp out with daddy's picture on it and it, when it finally came out, mommy had just passed. Mm. She worked her bones off to get it done. She and I know Doug worked with her and they worked and they went to where whomever they needed to go to and over and over again until it was finalized. And once it was finalized, she really didn't get a chance to see. And um, I'm sorry for that. So I know that this would be an overwhelming, would, would just make her so very happy to see what is going on today. Today, this would make her so very happy. Judy, if I oh. could just add one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, before they actually issued the stamp, mm -hmm. they had hired uh, a, an artist to create the stamp. Mm -hmm. And they sent me an eight by 10 photo of that and I um, headed out to mom's and I sat down with her. She was sitting in her chair. She looked at it, a tear came down her face. She said, they finally remembered him. Mm -hmm. And she died, she died a few days later. And so mm -hmm. she never saw the official stamp, but she did yeah. know what it looked like and she <laughs> know it had been done. Uh-huh, great, 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 great. I love to hear that. And and you you all saw the stamp in the background when Josh White Jr. Yeah. Yes. Someone in the chat even asked, what is that interesting artwork? And, and that's what it was. It was Buddha. It was Buddha in the background of Buddha's part. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> I have one other comment. Uh, Doug, I remember that time when you brought the Josh White um, celebration to the North American Folk Alliance Conference. Yes. Um, I have to say that that is one huge community that still is woefully unaware of Josh White. Mm -hmm. um, Doug, and I don't know who else, I know that the guy Davis was there and several other people, but we had um, the Folk Alliances, we in the folk community, it's our trade show, you might call it. 2,000 folkies in one hotel looking for work, trying to connect. And all kinds of programs are going on, and the Josh White program was going on, and I was not about to miss it. The only thing is that next door in the big hall, 
simultaneously was the Pete Seeger celebration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was packed to the walls. There was just a handful, maybe a dozen people at the Josh White celebration. Doug, mm -hmm. I think you should do it again. There, I, I, well, I would like, that was on his 100th birthday. Right. And, and I, I did nicely question them why do you have to put it next door to, to Pete's celebration at, at the same time? It's yeah. a three-day three, three day convention, and yet here they put them next to each other. Yeah, Pete Seeger, who is already known by every person in that, yes. you know, Josh White deserved a moment to where people were able to get to know him, mm -hmm. especially in the community of which he would probably might have been a part had yeah. time been a different way. Well, you, you can help. I've, I'm trying to convince them, and you certainly could help, um, to consider honoring him with their Lifetime Achievement Award. Whatever I can do. Okay, I appreciate it. Maybe this is the start of history happening. <laughs> yes, and, and like I said, maybe every August 20th, there'll be a Josh White Folk Festival. Folk and Blues Festival. It's a great idea. I'll be there. <laughs> well, we are unfortunately out of time this evening, um, so we're going to have to, to say goodbye. Um, what an incredible evening we've had. Um, for more information about Josh White, though, you can check out um, Josh White Society Blues um, by Elijah Wald from the library. <laughs> um, that library, of course, is our greenvillelibrary.org. You can go to that website and search. Also, there's a link in the chat for more uh, content that's about Josh White, too. So definitely check that out. We also have a special Freegal playlist. It's got, I believe, over 100 songs in that playlist. That's free with your library card as well. You can download five songs per week and enjoy three hours of streaming per day with Freegal. So um, that link will also be in the YouTube video description uh, below this video when we post it. Thank you so much to the White family and the contributions you know, of Josh White Jr., um, Judith, Guy, Vincent, uh, Buddha. Thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Um, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> committee. Thank you. My dear Mr. Thompson, we just thank you all. It's been a great evening. I can't wait to meet all of you at the at the dedication. Yes, you're, you're going to be smothered with a bunch of hugs. Good. <laughs> and, and will it, will it be possible for people who weren't able to make it this evening to see the presentation uh, somehow? Yes, absolutely. So we will always um, put a recording of our presentations up on the library website. I will also send it to everyone who registered to attend tonight. Um, so Doug, you'll definitely get a link to it and you can disseminate that as, as you please as Great. well. Um, so it's, it's, it's public, it's available for, for anyone to view. So, and if you missed something, you signed in late, you can catch up and, and check out the things that you missed too. Um, so that's always going to be available. We like to say the library is 24 seven. So even if the building's not open, you can access things from our website. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, thank you to, to Joe for sharing about um, the sculpture. Doug, um, for all of your work with the White Family Estate, Ray Misick and the Greenwich Village uh, Folk Festival, Document Records, um, and of course the Josh White Sculpture Committee that all those forces combined to make this a fantastic evening. Uh, be sure to check out the sculpture downtown if you're in Greenville or make a special trip to Greenville. You don't want to miss it. It's beautiful. Like Joe said, you can check it out different times of day um, and enjoy that afternoon light as well. Until our next event, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter and sign up for our e-newsletter so you don't miss out on wonderful events like this. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much, everyone. And we hope you have Thank a good Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. All the Greenville kids, my name, folks, I'm trying to introduce myself to you. The Greenville kid is my name, trying to introduce myself to you. Says I'm all hot and bothered, but I don't know what to do. Says the kid's not so hot and the Greenville kid's not so cold. Greenville kid's not so hot, Lord, the kid is not.
not so cold It's cause of me Because I worry about him Deep down in their soul I'm a young healthy kid But it's my girl What's worrying me so I'm a young healthy kid It's my girl What's worrying me so I wouldn't be feel so low down, but I can't see my girl no more. Yeah, I am in this big city, and I'm doing the level best I can. Yeah, I am in this big city. Ooh, 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 ooh. If I keep on worrying about act a fool, go back home again. Set their cards on the table, they talk to the kid like a natural man. Cards laid on the table, they talk to me like a natural man. Say them jokes of hugging my woman, that's something I can't understand. Cause he left the girl he left behind Kids down in the heart He left the girl he left behind Try to do his best he can But she stays right on